Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mireya Gonzalez. Hi, my name is Dr. Zoe Lantel. And along with Dr. Jennifer Fernandez, we are a team of addiction experts who specialize in harm reduction. For those who are not familiar, harm reduction is a philosophy and therapeutic style rooted in compassionate and non on judgmental therapy, which allows room for abstinence and moderation management. We provide therapy for individuals, couples, and families, and offer support groups such as our harm reduction support group and our concerned significant other group. Due to COVID-19 and the current shelter in place mandate, we offer video sessions for California residents. And I just wanted to give everybody the heads up that this meeting is being recorded so folks can access it later. So to preserve your anonymity, please make sure that your video is turned off throughout the entire webinar. So why a webinar for concerned significant others? What is a concerned significant other? Um, anybody who has regular contact with people who are using drugs or alcohol. Um, concerned significant others, otherwise known as CSOs, often have more physical, behavioral, and psychological problems than the population at large. They can also experience increased rates of depression and anxiety and lowered self-confidence and increased somatic complaints. Um, concerned significant others can also experience more verbal and physical violence satisfaction in their relationships, reduced family cohesion, and increased interpersonal conflicts and stress. With all of this in mind, and adding a shelter-in-place mandate on top of it, these issues can amplify due to the increased amount of time spent with folks and due to higher level of substance use. For example, alcohol sales have increased by 25% during the first six weeks of shelter in place. And so we're seeing a lot more use and that combined with the shelter in place can create higher levels of stress and conflict for CSOs. So here is our little overview slide. Um, you'll see a few bullet points on the things we're going to cover. Identifying triggers and patterns leading to substance use understanding signs of intoxication, rewarding positive behavior and change, why ignoring intoxication can be good, positive communication, recognizing intimidation and violence, and taking care of yourself and building support. We will also have a Q&A at the end if we have enough time. So please send your questions directly to Dr. Fernandez and make sure that you're sending them to her privately and not to the group at large to maintain your confidentiality. If for, for whatever reason we run a little bit over and don't have time for the Q&A at the end, Dr. Fernandez will respond directly to the questions in the chat. So here's a little quote to get us started. The opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it is connection. I'm gonna hand it over to Zoe now. Great, hi. Um, so before we can learn how to improve our response to your loved one who is misusing substances, um, it's really important to first identify what happens before your loved one uses. Um, these are called triggers and they are people, places, situations, or things that are associated with an individual's past substance use and which can set off intense cravings um, or urges to use that substance. Um, an example of this might be when a loved one scrolls through their social media and sees advertisements for their favorite type of alcohol or other type of substance. Maybe they view pictures of their friends on um, something like Instagram um, and they see their friends drinking, people who they would typically drink with, um, which may kind of ignite, again, that intense desire on their behalf to also drink. Um, so if you plan to kind of respond to your loved ones um, and help them kind of succeed in recovery, it's good to understand the triggers. Um, and you can kind of begin to ask yourself some questions like, are there specific people who your loved one um, is more likely to misuse substances with? So um, 
certain friends, certain family members? Um, what's, uh, what's the setting? So where do they um, usually misuse substances? Are there specific events? Maybe right after they get paid, or right after they get their paycheck might be a time when they um, uh, misuse substances. Certain holidays or celebrations, that sort of thing. Are there certain days of the week or times of the day that your loved one misuses substances? Um, so maybe in the evening after the kids go to bed or solely on the weekends, Friday and Saturday. Um, are there certain moods that your loved one is usually in before using substances? Um, and not necessarily just a negative or kind of low mood, right? Often folks may use substances when they're actually in a positive mood um, because they anticipate that this kind of drinking or substance use um, may be more manageable and less harmful. So kind of looking out for that. Uh, finally, are there certain situations or circumstances that are more likely to result in substance use? Um, for example, after arguments, some, something like that. Um, next, we're going to look at um, better understanding. Oh, just a little. There we are. Um, understanding the signs of intoxication. Right there, great. Um, so since the strategies we're going to be talking about are implemented based on whether or not your loved one is sober, it's really important um, to have a good idea of when um, your loved one is sober and when um, they're intoxicated so you can properly implement the skills that we're gonna talk about. Um, and you can ask questions like, is there a change in your loved one's speech? So slurred speech, um, that type of thing. What changes do you notice in your loved one's actions? What do they do differently, let's say, when they're under the influence? Are they more, you know, passive? Do they sleep more? Do they eat more or less? Um, do they spend more or less time um, around family? Um, also, what changes do you notice in your loved one's mood? Are they more irritable, more upbeat? Um, are there changes in your loved one's appearance or dress? So do they have kind of a red, ruddy face, um, slurred speech, speech again, or dilated or droopy eyes? Um, I think intoxication can be a lot harder to recognize um, in a person than one might think. So it's important to just think about these questions and how they might apply to your loved one. All right, so now we are go going to talk a little bit about rewarding positive behavior. So rewarding positive behavior is paying positive attention to a behavior um, in a way in which that person enjoys. So this not only helps loved ones find positive and fun things to do while they're sober, but it also shows them that life is not always miserable while sober. So here are some examples of positive rewards that your loved one might enjoy. Watching your loved one um, play a sport or perform, watching a movie together, playing a game together, cooking a meal or getting takeout that they enjoy. These are just some examples and you can use the likes um, of your significant other to kind of shape what your positive reward system is going to look like. So helpful hints to rewarding positive change. Reward often. Behavior is learned most quickly if the behavior is rewarded every time it occurs. After a few weeks of doing so and rewarding every time a positive um, behavior is occurring, you can begin to taper down the frequency of the rewards and start to reward every other time. And that can incentivize your loved one to work harder for the rewarding behavior that they enjoy. So um, another tip is to change the reward. It is easy for somebody to become bored when the reward remains the same. So kind of coming up with your list of positive rewards that you can cycle between and try new things to help keep your loved one engaged and motivated towards receiving that reward. 
So making the connection for them. Make sure that they know that this reward is because they are managing or abstaining from their use. They, um, the connection is not necessarily going to be inherent for them. So if the connection is not made, the behavior may not change. Other rewards, knowing that you are fighting against other rewards is very important to keep in mind. There might be other people or other things trying to keep your loved one's behavior the same and keep them using. Um, so let this motivate you to maintain consistency in your rewarding behavior. Negative attention. So negative attention can be seen as better than no attention at all by your loved one. Therefore, if you pay attention to an activity that your loved one is doing, even if it is negative attention, you may be reinforcing that undesired behavior. So Zoe's gonna give you a little bit more information on this now. Great, yeah. So, um, right, so another way of encouraging change in someone's behavior is ignoring the unwanted behavior. And this means that when a loved one is misusing substances, you would remove um, any reward from their behavior by cutting back on how much maybe you talk to them or how much time you spend with them. Um, and it's kind of, it's important to utilize what I discussed earlier in terms of being able to recognize if your loved one is intoxicated or hungover. That way you have a good idea um, of when it's appropriate to withdraw your attention. So um, when doing this, like Maria said, um, you really want to make the connection for them. You want to make it clear um, to your loved one that, you know, in a matter of fact voice, you know, hey, I, I don't enjoy spending time with you when you're intoxicated. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do something else. So you're going to go ahead and do another activity um, during this time. Um, ignoring or withdrawing attention, you know, you can kind of see here on the list um, may mean going about your daily schedule or if possible leaving the house and going for a walk. Um, it means becoming more focused on your life. So your hobbies, your friends, um, your health and well-being it might be a good time to call up a trusted friend or family member to talk with them about um, what's bothering you or what's going on. Um, looking into kind of an online class maybe and something you enjoy doing, an online exercise class maybe. Um, you can utilize relaxation skills such as breathing exercises and meditation. Um, ignoring intoxication can be effective since it's likely that we've tried without much success to argue or complain our loved one out of being um, intoxicated. Um, and this typically has the opposite effect because as uh, Maria noted earlier, negative attention, right, can still be seen as better than no attention at all and therefore can really still reinforce their using behavior. So you want to try to avoid doing the things on this don't list. Um, so, you know, really trying not to punish your loved one by giving them the cold shoulder. You don't want to lecture or nag. You don't want to pour their substances down the drain or follow them around the house to make sure they're staying out of trouble. You don't want to cover up for their substance misuse. Um, it's probably not a great idea to try to have that type of, you know, productive conversation with them. Um, you want to try to engage, you want to try not to engage them in a fun activity to decrease tension. Um, and I know that at this point, it really may seem like all, you know, like this is much easier said than done. And certainly I don't mean to minimize um, how incredibly difficult and stressful it would be to really change this behavior. Um, I think that, you know, it's incredibly difficult because it often means that by, you know, withdrawing support or withdrawing attention, we um, are allowing our loved ones to experience the negative consequences of their behavior. Um, you know, for instance, a loved one who frequently misuses might lose their job or get in trouble at their school um, if you no longer are calling in sick for them, for instance. They could lose their housing if you stop loaning them money, right? Um, it's crucial to recognize, however, that withdrawing your support is actually an important way of implementing much needed boundaries in your relationship 
with your loved one. Um, boundaries that, you know, are really going to be benefiting both of you long term um, by allowing your loved one to learn how to build confidence in their ability to take care of themselves on their own and allowing you to conserve a significant amount of energy that you've likely been devoting to your loved one. I mean, you can kind of imagine if you had that energy back, really the bandwidth that you would have um, for yourself, for others, also for this loved one in a really positive and healthy way. Um, and imagine, you know, by doing this, it might decrease the amount of resentment as well that you might feel towards your loved one, um, which could have, you know, been possibly building up over time and how beneficial overall this would be for your relationship. Um, and I think that this sort of segues into our next topic on positive communication because understand, understandably there can be a considerable amount of sort of resentment and anger towards a loved one who continues to misuse substances and communication is often negatively affected as a result. Um, so moving Sorry guys, I'm trying to, this is Dr. <laughs> Fernandez here trying to manage all the tech and I'm running into a little bit of difficulty. I was trying to turn my video back on because I just wanted to add something to what Zoe said about withdrawing support. And I, I think that's a very nuanced discussion that maybe we don't have time to fully get into here. Um, but that if you're, if you're doing something like withdrawing money, for example, it may not be feasible for you to withdraw money for your loved one's housing because you know that if they don't have housing, they're going to use more. So that would be a type of support that you may choose to continue to give, but you may choose to not give them cash or something like that, like spending cash. Or you may choose, you know, you may decide that there are certain privileges that are really important for your loved one to have, like access to a phone. So you may choose to continue paying for your loved one's um, cell phone bill or something like that. So I think when we say withdrawing support, we're certainly not meaning like this tough love thing. Um, you know, like Andrew Tatarski says, tough love isn't love, love is love. And so you need to think for yourself, like, what are your boundaries? What, how, you know, how can you give without overgiving? Just like Zoe said, you don't want to be in a position where you are negating your needs or creating resentment in that relationship, because that's going to be toxic to the dynamic. Uh, so I just wanted to add that little blurb there just to, to clarify how much nuance and like um, individual um, factors play a, a part in how you give or withdraw support of a loved one. Sorry, and, Zoe. I just, no, thank you for adding that. It's really, it is important and it, there is a lot to say on the topic for sure. So, um, yeah, but right. So kind of those, those boundaries in your relationship are so important to have, um, and are, are great for both people involved. So yeah, so um, talking about communication, um, communication can be really difficult for most folks and can have kind of this added complexity to it when you're working, when one of the um, individuals is struggling with substance misuse. Um, there can often be um, negative communication patterns um, between family members, between maybe significant others that have been established early on in the relationship, maybe even before the problematic substance use. Um, and then fortunately, they, they don't tend to simply kind of disappear once the substance use is gone or that individual is kind of entered into recovery. Therefore, the development really of communication skills can really aid people in uncovering underlying issues that have been there for a long time. Um, so they're pretty important. This is another area in which it's probably, it's really important to remember that we can't make someone change. Um, and we really, um, we really can only change ourselves. So if we want communication to kind of start to go differently in a relationship, the best way to start that is to change our role or our part in that interaction and find these sort of new ways to effectively talk with our loved one. Um, so it's first really important to just sort of set the stage for positive communication. 
And you can do this by identifying a time um, when you guys are both calm, your loved one is sober, and you feel you can have that kind of productive communication. You know, if you're if you're getting you know heated, things are escalating. It's probably a good time to maybe you know take a time out, go for a walk if you can. Um, you know, separate and calm down. However, it's really important to remember to tell your partner that that's exactly what you're doing, that you're not just walking away, um, and identify maybe a time when you guys can come back and have the conversation um, and address the issues. That you're that you want to address so that you don't kind of sweep things under the rug and they get forgotten. Um, another important strategy is staying brief, concise, kind of staying in the moment. And we really want to avoid lecturing, which can sort of feel like this, um, you know, making that, that other person feel as if you're talking down to them. Um, so kind of you know, staying brief to the point. This also allows us to kind of um, that tendency to avoid um, or to, to kind of bring up all these other conflicts as well, maybe other things from the past that are that we sort of tack on to things that are going on for us in the present. When this happens, the other person tends to really stop listening to what you're saying, right? They're just sort of starting to just defend themselves or get, they get really kind of busy doing that and stop listening to what we're trying to convey to them. Um, you may also want to be specific, avoid um, generalizations, so, uh, avoiding words such as always or never. These types of statements rarely provide an accurate depiction of what's going on and again sort of cause your loved one to get more defensive. Um, developing empathy uh, for your loved one's experience is really important and you know this can take some time for sure but really by making the effort to better understand your loved one's perspective, you can really show them, you know, how much the relationship means to you, how much they mean to you. Um, it can really be um, a tremendous positive change um, when we sort of introduce that into our conversation. So um, accepting partial responsibility, conflicts, tend to be a two-way street, right? Um, it's not just one person who um, is responsible for all the issues at play and really being able to identify and explain your role in the problem, even if it's 1% your fault and 99% their fault, um, it can still, you know, just accepting even that, that small amount of responsibility can go a long way um, and really, again, help reduce kind of defensiveness. So, um, yeah. Moving ahead. There we go. Um, so once you've set the stage for productive um, communication, you can begin to think about how to con effectively convey what you want to say. Um, it's really good to start a conversation with a positive statement. And this really helps tune in the listener, right? It helps um, put you in a positive frame of mind about the person as well. Another way of thinking about this is saying what you want and not saying what you don't want. So saying something like, I like it when you're sober instead of I hate it when you're drunk. Um, never underestimate the power of I statements. So I statements really allow us to importantly take ownership of our feelings. So saying I feel worried when you drink instead of saying you make me feel worried when you drink. And again, that sort of takes ownership, helps reduce um, defensiveness. Um, next, make a request from your loved one. These need to be reasonable requests, something that your loved one can um, feasibly accomplish. And we have an example here. Um, I would like it if you would talk to me more about why you think you drink. Um, so that's just an example. This, these would be different, um, you know, based on, on your situation. And ending that conversation again with something positive. So kind of sandwiching the conversation between two um, two positive statements. And again, this could be something that the, um, the loved one might receive from following through with your request. So 
here we have increased trust between the two of you and therefore maybe overall improvement of your relationship. Um, or it could be something, you know, just positive about the person, what you like or admire about your loved one, um, such as maybe their willingness to even have these conversations with, with you, which, which might indicate their, um, their commitment to you and to the relationship. Um, <clears throat> so using kind of all these techniques together and combining our examples, you might say something like, I like it when you are sober. When you drink, I feel worried. I would like it if you would talk to me more about why you think you drink. If we talk more, we can develop more trust in our relationship and we will get along better. Right, so hopefully you can see here how um, this might be a way to create really a much safer place for more honest and open dialogue, um, how it might reduce defensiveness and increase really their belief and the truth that you have their best interest at heart. So now we are going to talk about recognizing intimidation and violence. Um, it is very important to know that your significant other may have an extreme reaction to changes in your behavior, um, especially if they have demonstrated uh, extreme anger in the past or perhaps anger when they're using. Violence happens in families where substance use is involved. Therefore, it is very important to check the level of potential violence in your household before implementing any changes in your behavior. So you really want to assess whether or not it's going to be safe for you to make these changes or not ahead of time instead of kind of diving right in and recognizing once you're in that it's, you know, a high risk situation. However, we are going to talk a little bit about developing a safety plan if you do find yourself in a situation where things are escalating and becoming violent. So here are some steps that you can take to develop a safety plan. Uh, you can recognize escalating conflicts and you can identify conflicts that are leading to, that have high potential for violence early on. So if you start to notice it at the beginning of the conversation that it's not going well, to just pause rather than continuing in a discussion that's getting more and more intense, especially if your loved one has a history of violence. You can get support from family or friend. You don't have to manage this alone. You can get help in finding solutions and feel free to ask for help. You can leave the situation. In some cases, it may be easiest to just leave the room. Like Zoe said, take a walk, take a breather for yourself, go into the other room, practice some deep breathing to help calm yourself down and give your significant other time to de-escalate as well. But in other situations, it might require leaving the home and using a quote safe house and a safe house is the home of a relative or friend or family and you'll want to identify that as early as possible to make sure that if the violence escalates to the point of being a risk to your safety that you can know exactly where you're going to go and have already discussed it with that person so as to eliminate any things that might make it more difficult. In some cases, it may require legal intervention. No one should have to live with abuse. Legal action, such as a temporary restraining order, uh, is a way for you to protect yourself and may also be a way to get your loved one's attention about the impact of their behavior and their use on the family and on you. So it's really important to build a support network um, a couple ways in which you can do this are by reviving old friendships, kind of going through different phases in your life and pulling out those folks who really stood out to you and have supported you in the past and reaching out to them even if you haven't for a while, allowing you to do so will create a bigger support network for you and perhaps make you feel a little bit more connected and during times that are already feeling so isolated, such as all of us right now in the shelter in place. You can develop interests that can be shared with others. So maybe joining um, some sort of online community for a shared interest that you have and meeting folks that way so you can meet new folks. I know it can be a little bit harder during shelter in place, but folks have been getting really creative doing cooking classes together, art classes together, something that you really enjoy that you know you'll have a common interest with. You can join a support group. 
Um, we have one that we have for care for significant others. Um, there are uh, Zoe can tell you a little bit more more about that later. But there's also Facebook groups that you can join to kind of have an online platform to discuss with other people who have a shared experience and feel very validated in that. It's also important to find somebody that you can confide in, whether that be a therapist or a friend or folks in your support group, making sure you can have somebody that you can be talking to all of this, talking about all of this with, right? It's, it's a lot to hold on your own and you shouldn't have to. So making sure you have a few folks in your life that you can share your struggles with and really be hurt by is very important. So don't forget to reward yourself. People who have a loved one struggling with substance use become very good at taking care of other people, but often forget to take care of themselves and sometimes don't even know how to take care of themselves well. So Zoe can talk to you a little bit more about our group now, which is an opportunity for you to be able to take care of yourself in a very intentional and supportive way. Great. So yes. So um, so this is the online craft group for concerned significant others. Um, you'll get really more in-depth info about some of the behavioral and communication skills that we've touched upon in this presentation, skills to kind of reduce the problematic substance use of your loved one and really improve your mental well-being. You'll also learn more about how and when to maybe intervene with treatment, how to support your loved one once they enter treatment and break in their recovery process. Um, right now, I think that we are aiming to start the group at the end of the summer, um, but it depends on really how much interest we get in it. So it could start sooner, possibly. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Fernandez. I don't seem to be able to turn on my video, so if Zoe or Medea could do that, that would be awesome. Um, so just to wrap up here, okay, great, thanks so much. Hi everybody. So just to wrap up here, I wanted to share some resources with you. Um, so Craft was developed by uh, Dr. Myers and Wolf. Um, I really, don't like the title that the publishers made them use <laughs> for this wonderful resource, uh, but it's Get Your Loved One Sober. And really it, it is a harm reduction um, oriented treatment. It is not about, it is not abstinence based. It really is about um, helping you as a, as a caregiver, figure out what your boundaries are, your needs. And then just like we've talked about today, some communication skills and basic, like what we call them, um, in our field, reinforcement schedules, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, techniques for changing behavior. Um, and I like getting your loved ones over or get your loved ones over because it's very pragmatic, very skills oriented, lots of examples, lots of assignments to help you really uh, develop and, and hone these skills. So that's a great resource. And then if you're looking for more um, kind of theoretical and science-based understanding of addiction and how people change. I really love uh, Jeff Foote's book, Beyond Addiction. He's the director over at uh, Center for Motivation and Change in New York. Um, so this one just gives you a little bit more background. Uh, the quote was from Chasing the Scream, which is another great book about addiction. Again, more of a perspective and theory um, and approach and less practical. Um, and then I'm sure many of you know about Gabor Matei's book um, in the realm of hungry ghosts, which is another wonderful um, book on addiction and trauma. I didn't include that one here because I just thought of it. Sorry. So um, another resource is some kind of support group. So we talked about the online support group that we're going to be offering. That's facilitated by Zoe, uh, Dr. Zoe Lantelm. She's a licensed clinical psychologist. So if you're really looking for uh, something that can go a little bit more in depth in the theory behind addiction and trauma and co-occurring disorders. Uh, we, you know, we work with a lot of folks who have mood disorder, a lot of folks who have personality disorder co-occurring with the addiction, um, then that might be helpful. If you're looking just for more peer support, 
I think everybody knows about Al-Anon, so I didn't include that here, but I don't think everybody knows about smart recovery, so I wanted to include that one. And this is specifically for family and friends. It meets online, it has only ever met online, so they are well established on the virtual meeting um, interface. And uh, smart recovery is based on cognitive behavioral therapy, so it will be much more pragmatic, strategic, um, and, and sort of manualized in that way. They have like a very um, concrete program for families and friends. And then just in case uh, you are worried about your physical safety or if there has ever been any instance of emotional abuse or financial abuse, we did include a couple of hotlines um, for folks who need to seek safety. Um, so the first one, Casa de las Madres, is for San Francisco and the Bay Area. And then I also included a national one for any folks who may be joining us um, from outside of the North Bay Area. So I think that's it from us. We do have some time left. So if folks have questions, uh, we would be happy to take them. You can um, send a message to any of us and we can unmute you if you want to speak. We, do, we are recording. So again, just a reminder um, for your confidentiali confidentiality and anonymity if you don't want to speak. Um, you can chat us a message. Otherwise, you can always reach out to us uh, either on our website or our email, which is below on the footer of the slide. Um, and we really hope that you found today's webinar helpful. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you guys found this really helpful. Thank you all for coming.